Car Lifestyle Podcast with host Seth Rose from Exotics Rally, T minus Gabe Florido from Car Lifestyle. Yeah. Seriously? <laughs> it's a Howard Stern thing. Like, is it? Yeah. Remember that whole scene when he did on, um, was it Match Game? It's like blank a doodle do. Oh, shit. Cock. And he's like, cock coming ahead of his mouth, out of his mouth. He's got a big black cock coming out of his mouth, and that's not dirty? Damn. And she wrote it sloppy. He says he's got a sloppy pussy in on the whole thing. Yo, you Come better on, be recording all that shit. <laughs> is, Are you? What? Are you recording all that shit? Just came Welcome up? to podcast number 14. Yes! We are blackmailing Andrew Zalison. <laughs> we are back. Blackmailing about, about black stuff? other things. <laughs> Welcome back. Car Lifestyle, podcast number 14. We hope you all uh, found that first uh, 30 seconds entertaining. Uh, my name is Seth Rose. I'm here with T-Minus. Hello, T-Minus. Yo, yo. Hollywood is back in the house. I am here. And featuring our guests for today are... Our the, special guests. Our special guests. That's right. None other than Elizabeth White. Hey, guys. From It's White Noise. And Andrew Zalison. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yes, you did. Excellent. Hold on. Let's get back to the formal introduction. Elizabeth White's fiancé, oh, Andrew Zalison. I wasn't aware of the news. <laughs> Is this news? Is it not news? I, I don't know you all that well. T-minus is more familiar with you. So I, I did not know that you were actually engaged. <laughs> it's not real news, but it's uh, it's news. Yeah. Well, that's their official titles. Okay. Right. It's official. Yeah. So Congratulations. Don't forget to put that word in front of every time you mention our names. <laughs> what? Yeah, you got that, stuff. <laughs> yeah, you got that? It's fiance. Fiance. White. And fiance Andrew Zalson. <laughs> Okay, wait, great. and wait. Yes. And AKA, it's white noise. Yes. So, or better known as. All right. We'll start off the podcast with uh, introducing uh, Andrew and Elizabeth. Uh, I'm sorry, Andrew and his fiance, Elizabeth. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and we'll start off with It's White Noise because a lot of people don't know anything about It's White Noise. They've seen it maybe as a hashtag, they've seen it on Instagram. What is It's White Noise? You know, It's White Noise is a, a media platform. It sounds very um, majestic, but at its core, what It's White Noise is trying to do is bring together everybody who loves automotive and folks who are the enthusiasts, folks who are creating the content, photographers, videographers, and the folks who really consume that content all in one place. It's, it's something that when I was younger, you would go to the car magazines and you would look at, you know, various different, uh, you know, websites, but now, there's really no center of gravity for automotive. You have the car lifestyles, which are great. Two and a half, I believe, million. Yes, sir. Two and a half uh, million followers. Followers, which is awesome. But that's Thank just you. a small slice of, of the folks out there. There are you know, probably a billion plus folks who are interested in automotive. It's one of the largest areas, but it's just not served very, very well. And Elizabeth had a great idea of bringing everybody together, really disintermediating the creation of uh, content, meaning taking out the middlemen, taking out the agents and everybody who wants to take a slice and making it more of a pure experience so that if you want to experience something in, in Formula One, you want to look at something where there's a Jeep, you want to look at you know, motorcycles down the road, it's some place you can go and you don't feel like you're working too hard. It's almost like Playboy magazine in the old days, which is it's, it's photographs, it's imagery, it's beautiful. If you want to read the articles, great. Because there'll be articles, but it's really all about the experience. Mm. And it, has it been launched yet, or is this something in, in the works? Well, to go back to the beginnings, Elizabeth had, uh, was publisher of a publication called Speed Hunters. And post that, I learned a lot of lessons about how to build a website and how to build a media property. Her desire was to not take a template and to take something that already existed, but really create something in a native form. And so the process of finding programmers to be able to realize her dream and her vision started probably the better part of six months ago. And so it is in beta right now. Mm -hmm. We have a, a whole host of folks who are content creators, generators, and consumers who are beating up the site as you do with betas to make sure it's perfect, which it'll never be. It's constantly evolving. But it's something that is in, in beta right now. We look to launch uh, in the next few months. 
Wow, it's interesting. So basically, it's just going to be a super highway for the automotive industry? You know, that's a great way of putting it. it, it it'll add uh, velocity and take out all the friction, something Hollywood knows a little bit about, <laughs> what he does. But um, Hollywood yeah. knows tons about friction. About fr <laughs> or taking out the friction. Um, but to use big words and things, it's democratizing. Uh, the content creation. That's something Hollywood's not familiar with. Okay. Big words, yeah. We, <laughs> or, <laughs> he's limited to seven letters, I think, was it? <laughs> Can you define that, please? Uh, no. I don't know what the Puerto Rican scholastic <laughs> system, you know. You know, it's like pornography. The That's Supreme Court said, you know, I can't define it, but I know when I see it. That's there it. you go. There it's you a go. very famous line. <laughs> Interesting. So uh, Hollywood's pissed. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> I think I just saw him turn red, which is highly unlikely. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's the ketchup that's at the table. <laughs> so anyway, um, all right. So it's white noise. That's a little bit behind uh, the platform that you've built, and you're looking to launch it uh, soon. Um, Obviously, based off. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. Okay. Off, based off your name, Elizabeth White. Well, yeah, I don't know if it's based or, but it was an inspiration. Mm. It and truly came it from Instagram because everyone has a name on Instagram. It's their, you know, Beyonce name. It's their um, identity, yeah. yeah. So my name ultimately became It's White Noise via Instagram, and that is where we're naming our platform. Interesting. Yeah, it's all relative, yeah. So I'm sure it's gaining a lot of traction. And I mean, have you seen a lot of, uh, have you been getting a lot of inquiries based off of Instagram? Is that where most of your... You know, I, I, think, I think that the relationships that we've had over the years, and for me it goes back you know, quite some time, throughout the automotive uh, community, whether it's manufacturers, whether it's race drivers, whether it's collectors, whether it's just enthusiasts or content generators, photographers, and what Elizabeth has done over the last five years, including what you've, did, what you've done before with some of the, uh, the media properties. So it's taking existing relationships where there's a lot of respect and there's a history, and talking about something that's new and great that everybody gets mm. and people are just joining in I mean you, you started a hashtag a few months ago and it's grown to 50,000 right. in no time whatsoever so you know it's people you know and you've worked with who have that respect and that working relationship they see you're doing something you're passionate about and they want to be part of it certainly it's true. I feel we live the car life. We are constantly on the road, constantly driving, constantly traveling. Yeah, I, I definitely want to get into that. So why don't we go through a little history of yourselves? That's what I was going to... I want, yeah, let's, let's you know, give our audience a real... like um, Insight of who you are and what you're about, where you came from, <laughs> where you're going, what you drive, and why you drive what you don't drive. Don't start with what they're, where they're going, because that list is super long. Yeah, it's long. a long list. They, are, they yeah. are extreme travelers, it seems, and most of it's based on the automotive industry. Or around motorsports. Oh, you're right. And maybe Percent. Elizabeth was a poor sharecropper from West Virginia. Why don't you start off with that? She isn't um, far from the truth. But. Well, I, yes, I was born in West Virginia. Um, I guess I started... Sorry to hear that. <laughs> I blew by there in Bull Run one year. Bad. Yes, yeah. that's great about it. <laughs> that's great at blowing things. Oh. That's nice. Yes. <laughs> Red light specifically. <laughs> okay, so West Virginia... Um, I think my love for automotive started a little later. Um, I didn't know I loved automotive. I went to events, NASCAR, trucking, mud bogs, like everything that you can't imagine that anyone who wants to drive a supercar in the future did. Um, I also learned how to drive on a 1985 Monte Carlo that my grandmother gave me. That um, was actually my first car. Was it? An 85 Monte Carlo SS. An SS with the arrow back? Uh, no, that Ooh. that came out. That, in 80, that was very. That came out in eighty nine. Yeah. No, that one so. or eighty seven. Eighty six. Did it really? Yeah. You're Sorry, right Seth is from that era, so you know he knows. I am. What, is it, <laughs> what does SS stand for? Super Sport. Oh, okay. In my neighborhood, growing up, it stood for stupid shit. But, <laughs> that's, uh, well, that's probably why I crashed it. That's probably yeah. <laughs> <laughs> stupid shit. All right, so you learned to drive on a Monte Carlo. I mean, the column or the. Um, shift was on the column. It was yeah. like sofa seats. You could have all your friends at once. You could probably have about 10 high schoolers in the car. It was really amazing. Um, but I do want to tell this story about how I first started driving to high school. I have a sister. Her name is Natalie. And she is late to everything. She is still late to everything. But we learned every single like 
back road, side road, where you could brake, where you had to turn on the AC, where you had to, you know, cut two lanes over to get off the exit to make it to school on time. There was... <laughs> where you had to cut the AC just for the extra horsepower? Yeah. Really? And then to throw it back on oh, to yeah. slow down. She was a... <laughs> what, 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 the story I heard from your sister was it was late braking into the apex, sort of like, not trail braking, but really late getting the car rotated so that you could get off the highway really, really fast. It was a hell of a line that... She, I've, I've, I've been on before. that road, and I was like, you did what, when, and how? It's I mean, in West Virginia, it was impressive. on the hills. We completely took the <laughs> took jumps and things. It was, yeah, I mean, I wanted to get to took school. Took jumps? Time. Yeah. Are you kidding? It's yeah. West Virginia, dude. It's not Queens. Oh, thanks, Seth. <laughs> <laughs> there's hills. There's Who's jumps in Queens, too? All right, so, so you learned how to drive in a Monte Carlo. <laughs> or you get jumped in Queens, you know, yeah. one of the two. Yeah. Wait. And then from from a Monte Carlo, you went to. Oh, the uh, Cavalier. Pretty okay. awesome. <laughs> and and what was the what was the first, uh, you know, either luxury sports car exotic that you ever drove? Mm. Um. A Ferrari. Okay. <laughs> what Ferrari? Where? When? Why? <laughs> um. I I'm thinking it was. I went to Art Basel when I was like 20 years old um, with some friends doing events and someone just picked up, I, all I remember was his name was Chapman and he just picked up a white Ferrari and he let me drive it. And I was like, this is my life, I have to do this. It was just so exciting, I mean, exactly the point where you're on Collins and you hit about 70 miles an hour, you're like, this is incredible. So, so you were hooked from there? I think so. Oh, wait, wait, you, wait, wait, uh, hold on. Yeah, let's, okay. let's, yeah, no, let's get into the, like, what, where did you come from, Liz? Like, um, how do you, what did you do? You know, like a brief, like, rundown of what you did in your life before you got into the car world. <laughs> and the pre-car career. Correct. There you go. Yeah. And you came up in West Virginia. Mm-hmm. Um, started learning to drive very early on and then blah, blah, blah. Before okay. driving, do you? Well, I think you mean... When I was two, I started doing dance. I started taking ballet classes since I was a little kid. Oh, Hollywood also. Yeah? yeah, yeah. You did ballet? No, absolutely not. It <laughs> sounds good, though. I'm just going along with this. <laughs> <laughs> he loves wearing tutus. So I was... So does T, I hear. <laughs> oh. You don't want to see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah we do. No, That's no, only no, on the no weekends, one does. Right? No, no. That's why this podcast is not visual. Yeah. <laughs> Let's remember that. Yeah, we're going to remember it. <laughs> Hence... Um, But all I wanted to do since I was a little kid was dance and sing, and I would watch, you know, all the Broadway shows on, um, you know, movies and Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly and stuff. And so I was like, that is my dream. I want to move to New York City and dance. I want to be on Broadway. I want to be a rocket. That's really what I wanted to do. It's so true. And you accomplished that. I did. I did two seasons at Radio City, and I did Mamma Mia, the Broadway show. But you did two seasons in Radio City as a Rockette? Yes. Yes. And then you did the play, right? Mm-hmm. Mamma Mia? Um, prior to that, when I was um, 18, I toured a little bit with a pop singer. Um, Which pop singer? <laughs> <laughs> um, people might have heard of her. Yeah, they might have. Do <laughs> tell. Do Go tell. Ahead. Go ahead. Her name was Jessica Simpson. Oh. Still is, actually. Her name yeah. is still Jessica Simpson. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but so I started my guess my dance career as a backup dancer. Cool. And then how'd you get into what was your next step and then how'd you get into it? Next from step. dancing. <clears throat> like how did you get into we know you did PR for McLaren for two years and how'd you get into that and Uh well I had to make money. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um I actually very much enjoyed um anything around marketing, branding. Um, public relations, any digital communications, overseeing any of that. So at McLaren, it was it was a true learning experience because when we launched, there was only a couple, handful of people in the office. So you were pulled in many ways to do whatever it was that was asked, even the Monroney label, like the window sticker. Mm. Uh, my hand was all over that, which is incredible because... Who knew growing up in West Virginia that you'd ever work for a Formula One team and then their car brand and make their window sticker? I didn't even know that was a real job. Now, now you, had, you had that job upon the launch of the MP412C? Is that when yeah, they when created my, that? And how many people know what that window sticker is called? I mean, 
You pulled that one out, the Mulroney. Right? Mulroney, yeah. Mulroney, that, that's Who knows a big what one. that is? <laughs> Up until that point, I was calling it a window sticker. Yeah, well, that's the official <laughs> <laughs> label for a window sticker. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be serious. The window sticker that, that McLaren has is so much larger than the single sheet that prints out from Lamborghini or Porsche. Or it's anyone. just compensating or overcompensating. Um, hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was total corporate well, what, identity. What cars are we talking about? The 12C or the 650S, the window sticker that was for the McLaren. Oh, the window sticker to buy the car, mm-hmm. the MSRP. Oh, I, okay. It's full color. It's actually it has... called a Monroni. It's like a pamphlet. It's, it, it's it is called a Monroni? Monroni is the actual. I didn't even know that. Of it. And wait, wh- and what did you do? Uh, I had a hand in creating what is the window sticker for every McLaren right now. Awesome. So it has <laughs> the correct font, correct everything the corporate identity is fully laid out on this larger than every other brand's sticker oh that's cool and then how did you you did pr for the f1 team right so how did you get into that it was all it was all included with what we did at mclaren oh companies like that have startups really i think mclaren is one of those is a small operation so elizabeth you were doing a little of everything so if they said, well, we right. need this, we don't have somebody to do that, you jump in and do it. So, mm-hmm. so you're like a jack of all trades for the same place. Pretty much. Pretty much. But that came out of your work with um, Society Perrier and, and some of the things you did. Right, that's what I'm trying to get on. Strategic you know. group and LVMH and, right. and the luxury yeah, so branding. Yeah, you know, talk about the best stuff. <laughs> um, about how you launched this you know, huge uh, marketing upswing for Perrier, right? So prior to working at McLaren, um, Going back to the, I need to make money um, because I mean, having a dance career is amazing, but to actually be able to support yourself in a city like New York, you have to have a, a decent income. Mm. So I started working for um, marketing and, you know. Um, you so I started working for marketing companies and just doing promotions and random things that you know, were needed um, in the industry for wherever I could get work. So for Perrier, there was a push to bring a younger demographic to their water. I mean, everyone thought it was an an old person's drink or from the past. I still think it is an older person's drink. <laughs> Perrier? Yeah, I've never, I've never really ordered that. Well, the beautiful Fucking thing Perrier's about delicious. what Elizabeth was able to do there was that she went to new areas, new regions, whether it was Moscow or Sao Paulo and things, where they didn't really have that that old view. It wasn't there before. And you brought all the younger, hipper decision mm-hmm. makers and style leaders and taste makers into the fold, sort yeah. of what you did with McLaren and, and some of the other projects. I mean, originally it was thought that we would do as much work for trendsetters and tastemakers in specific markets as they would do for us. So I would go and find someone in Istanbul or Toronto or Miami who was a jewelry designer or an art director or a musician, anyone who was actively in the industry. And we would promote them and sponsor their parties and be a part of whatever the events that they were in. And they would then in return blog for us once a week. Right. It's a way to stay current. Exactly. Awesome. So you had experience with Perrier, you had experience with McLaren, and then you come to, what's next? You did some LVMH, a little yeah. bit of champagne. Yeah. Um, similar to what we were doing with um, Perrier, we did with um, national events for um, LVMH. So So basically you focused on branding and, mm-hmm. uh, and brand awareness for a lot of different companies. And for exactly. all our audience uh, who are not familiar with LVMH, that's Louis Vuitton, Moet, Moet Hennessy. and Hennessy, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. And that's one parental company. Hollywood lit up when you said Hennessy. Of yeah. course. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he was like, did you say Henny? Oh, he Hennessey. was like, yo, son, the hood, son. <laughs> <laughs> they are just a true powerhouse. They represent everyone. Mm-hmm. If, if you're a luxury goods or a brand, you want to be involved with them. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting to me is in, in branding, um, 
uh, you know, across the world, a lot of people don't understand, I'm sure you might agree or disagree, but uh, hopefully agree, but a lot of companies will spend billions of dollars on branding, and their bottom number is not as much as a lot of other companies, but that just makes people more aware. I always, I always, you know, when people ask me about my business and they say, you know, what's a better product, uh, 3M or Avery when it comes to vinyl? Mm -hmm. I say, well, you know, truthfully, I happen to like Avery, but 3M has better branding, and they spend more money on it, just like Grey Goose is not the best vodka. But they spend so much money on marketing and branding, it's so well known, people just ask for that automatically. So that goes a long way, I think, with branding. And Awareness marketing. as yeah. well. Mm. Yeah. I mean, and identifiable to the specific market. I mean, look at Coca Cola. Sure. You always know what Coca Cola is. You might not always know what the other cola brands are, but as soon as you see that red can with the cursive writing, you know it's Coca Cola. Oh, absolutely. Coca -Cola. I think it's one of the most. Notice, uh, well known, well known brand that logos in the world. I think I right. think it's top ten. It was that, if not top five. No, it, it absolutely is. It, it's about the history and the heritage and how somebody embraces it and has. It doesn't have to be aspirational necessarily. You have mm. brands like Ferrari, which are worldwide and recognized. Coca Cola, maybe is a little aspirational for some folks, but it's something. It's a lifestyle. It's something you want to be a part of. And how do you really? Has, what's the ethos around the brand? And how do you bring that forward? And how do you make it relevant to new areas and new people like Perrier, which you said before, it's an old people's drink. Right, and I always I always consider just like Red Bull. Red Bull's a young person's drink. Mm -hmm. My mother right. certainly would. Or at least that's what's the identity <laughs> that's associated with it. Yeah. Right. And, and if she and did we'd have a problem. <laughs> and brand but brands need to continue to evolve and see where they are and what you were you were big on. Elizabeth and I were at a um, Well you always want to widen the spectrum of your audience. You need and you always. deepen it. We were at a, um, a conference that I helped put on at Tuck, at Dartmouth's Business School last year, last fall, about values of cars and automotive. It's uh, by Haggy, the Historic Auto Group International. Great think tank. They were talking, we had a bunch of people up in panels talking about their old cars and the value and how they're increasing in value. You know, Elizabeth stood up and she said, you have to understand that the younger audience Kids might like cars, but they don't know how to drive stick shifts. You said you That's did true. A, yeah. Did a survey. Eleven? Would you say eleven percent of kid people under, under 30. thirty know how to drive one, and two eleven percent only two percent own one? It's you're right, though. It's so disturbing. I, I went I went to a Jiffy Lube the other day just to get a mm -hmm. quick oil change on my Jeep, and another guy brought in his BMW. There was a stick. And all the guys looked at each other like, uh, you've got to be kidding me. They asked the customer to pull the car in. Are you kidding? Dead serious. No, no, but that's the problem. The problem it's is scary. that the value that we see, the cars, and I, I have this conversation with the folks at Porsche and, and other car manufacturers, it's you need to make it relevant. You have a history and a heritage. You have this market. It's great. It's aspirational. It's passion. It's all this stuff. But if you don't have something for the right market and you're not constantly evolving, it's Red Bull. If they don't continue to go younger, and hit that core, the kids won't know what it's about. Right. right. You don't know how to drive right. a stick shift, and you've got an old 50, whatever, call it a Porsche or, or a Camaro, and it's a stick shift, and kids are now 30 and 40, and they don't know how to drive one, the car is worthless. Not just worth less, but it's worthless. Because if the guys with the money, a couple of years forward, can drive the car, they're not gonna want it. You're right. And it's about need and want, desire and passion, and. and and all those kinds of things. And that's really what automotive's about. It's market driven. What you know, we always kid about, I think you and I had this conversation about the F body cars, the Camaros and the Firebirds. Mm -hmm. Same damn car. Different nose, different tail, some things in the inside are a little different. But kids would go, I'm never buying a Pontiac. Right. I'm a i I'm a Chevy guy. I'm a Camaro I'm, guy. I'm, Certainly. I'm not gonna yeah, I'm gonna buy a Camaro. My dad had a Camaro. This that's it true. Was, it was what was put in the head. And, and, and really about marketing. You know, basic transportation is basic transportation. Why do you spend 60, 70, 80, 90 thousand dollars on a car? It speaks to who you are, how you feel about it, how you get out of the car, whether you look back at it, when you walk away, whether you put a smile on your face. All that stuff, it's about the branding. And you were talking about before. Yeah. How does it make you feel? It, it's, you know, that's, and that's what you're really working on now with It's White Noise. It's about getting all the constituents who are involved in automotive, whether they're manufacturers, the aftermarket people, the experienced people, the people who love to look at photographs, the stuff you're doing on car lifestyle, beautiful imagery, you know, or whether, and it's the kids sometimes, 17, 16, 12, 12 year olds uh -huh. Elizabeth has met who are on Instagram, you wouldn't know they're 12. Mm. Brilliant, no. the passion just comes through in their photographs, bringing them all together and saying, you know, we're all in the same world, we love the same stuff, 
how do we work together? And without people feeling like you're taking pieces out of you when you join this this club of automotive enthusiasts. It's a lot of fun. Mm. And, and, and it's grown by leaps and bounds. I mean, social media alone has taken it to a whole new level. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, they call them the corporazzi now. That's I right. Mean, it's huge. I know out here on Long Island, every uh, like Saturday and Sunday morning at the Americana Shopping Center, parents are dropping their kids off in the morning with their cameras and a couple of dollars car coffee, spotting. And they sit there and they wait for cars to pull in and they chase you down. Right, but that's largely because of the uh, wild success of Instagram. Oh, absolutely. Because and, and in, order to get your, in order to get your follow count up, you have to post pictures of things people want to see. One is cars. So you, you know, there's this tremendous pressure to get your follow count up. So you are now not posting pictures of your lunch and your new sneakers and the car your mom drives. Now you're posting pictures of Ferraris and Lamborghinis and it's now influencing all these younger kids to get a better camera, to you're, take better pictures. You're absolutely right. It, it's, it's funny with the early days of social media, whether you go back or even just talk about it starting at Facebook. People are now getting together around interests. It used to be your friends and the people you hung out with and the people you shared life with were mm -hmm. folks from your neighborhood because they were close by. Mm. Now you can share things with people across the globe. And 12-year-olds take photographs of a Ferrari or a Maserati or a Porsche, whatever it is, somebody's commenting on it halfway across the world. So well, that's why Facebook should take, change it from a friends list to like an acquaintance list. <laughs> mm. It's about interest, right? It's yeah. about what you're it's passionate about. about. Interest. Right. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a, your passion. It's the things that you share with others, regardless of socioeconomic, you know, mm. religion. It doesn't matter anymore. It's about wow, there's a gorgeous car. If you look on your two and a half million followers, you probably have no clue, nor do you care about what part of the world they're from, how much money they make, what religion they are, it doesn't, and that's the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. That is the beauty about what's going on. So a 12 year old or an eight year old or a 15 year old is getting dropped off to take pictures. He's sharing, not with the people nearby who may think he's a geek because he's got this, or whatever it is, but he's sharing on a global basis. That's True. awesome, that's mm -hmm. awesome that we can do it that. It is, it is amazing. Um, obviously powered by the internet and the wild success of that. Um, Another great thing is that Instagram's free. Yes, I mean it's a huge. I mean it's a huge. Avenue. You know the, the first how long, how long is it going to stay free? I don't know. You're seeing. I think it's a location based. They they know where you are. They're serving things up now that are more relevant. But but the awesome thing also about that is that it's it's curated, meaning you're not getting shown ads for something you're not interested mm -hmm. in. They understand you're yeah. looking at cars. They understand you're looking at something. Which is dangerous. And I see, see you looking it's at me. Such, it's <laughs> such intelligence and marketing, man. But it is. And look, it started with Amazon. It moves over to this. But if you're. Oh, Amazon started there? Well, they, there's ads on Amazon? I mean, the it facial is, recognition on Facebook, I know. Oh, that, that shit is crazy. No, but Amazon, <laughs> Amazon was brilliant in the beginning where they had the recommendation engine. And it said, if you're interested in this, oh, right. you'd be interested right. in that. Right. And you're like, you know what? That's awesome. And with Groupon, one of the failures early on was they would send you different Random. ads. Off, I would get, right. and I always use this as a great example, I'd get pole dancing classes. Yeah, now, while yeah. I'm, I'm I interested getting, like, in that, it's like awesome. Like waxing. Like, I'm not interested in waxing. <laughs> you know, maybe one aspect of it, but you're not doing it. But when you get stuff that's curated, mm. you, know, you walk into a candy store and there are a thousand pieces of candy, like, overload. Right. But if you get, you know what, I like chocolate, white chocolate, and then you get the five pieces that you like that are in front of you, choose from those. Right. That's what Instagram is. The ads that are around that are more relevant. You're not likely to get pissed off about an ad for something now. True. Because it's like State Farm or somebody else, they go on my Instagram feed every once in a while. Sponsor. It's a sponsor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It's not as offensive. Sure, you get pissed. You're like, oh, block this ad or tell them I don't like it. Right, you mm. hide it, yeah. But you're not so pissed off when it pops up. And if when it's relevant to what you like, absolutely. It's all about that. It's that relevance. It's that, it's that ecosystem. And, right, and you know, um, it's always a pleasure to listen to you, Andrew, and because you have so much experience in different fields and marketing and branding. Um, can we get into a little brief history of who Andrew is and, you know, the, the brains behind this new platform, It's White Noise, and uh, everything you know, the, the, the brains behind the platform are really sitting to my left, and it's Elizabeth. It's Your fiancé, yeah. Elizabeth. Yes. <laughs> you know, any, anybody can have a fiancé. Yes. Um, you too, T, you know, at some point in time. Yeah, I'm sure there's a, plenty of blind women out there that would love to date me. <laughs> you know what? We were, we were on the gumball rally, and it was sponsored by Asian Date and, and Anastasia, and a, Anastasia Date. 
And um, you go on the gumball next year, you may already be a winner. Um, or just go on their website. Just. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know who these people are. Who are they? They, they basically have dating services to get, I, I presume. Do they have a uh, handicap section? Uh, yes. That's Good. Their general I'm in section. It's, You're in. It's, it's, I'm in. That's it. It's, it's a wrap. Social misfits are fine. And yeah, you if, you if, would, like if you, you know, if you have a seeing eye dog and you'd like to date, then, you know, they send you right to the T-minus page. They have everything right now. They have like farmers in love and stuff. Nice. Farmers in love. Thank farmers you so in much. Right. I'm trying to find out about what yeah. Andrew has done in his life, and you guys are trying to hook me up with farmers. All right, thank you so much. No, no, you know, so, so we got a little bit of Elizabeth's background, right. all the marketing and that type of jazz. Now, Andrew, I, I know that you're a uh, venture capitalist, right? Yes. And uh, and you've had. What, what, do, what do you mean by that? You know, it's funny. I'm gonna, I'm gonna... A lot of people don't know actually what that means. You know, and, and a lot of our listeners want to know about people, um, you know, gaining wealth, maintaining wealth, investing, and things of that nature. Because there's a lot of unknowns out there. People hear the word, they say, "Ooh, he must have a lot of money." Venture capitalist. Right. That could, it could mean a million different things. What does it mean to you? Or you know, how and who, you who is Andrew Zellis, and how did you get started? And you know, you can get into how you met Liz, and how you're, you know, everything that's going on. You know, the the thing is, and you've raced. You've raced cars, and people that have been on the track, you try to look forward and you don't look back. And I think that's the beauty of our relationship. Um, venture, whatever you call it, some people call it vulture capital, venture capital. The, the beauty is being able to back entrepreneurs, people who have a passion, and give them your experience. And there's capital that's involved with that. It's not like Shark Tank, by the way. Mm. And when I watch that show, I always have a raised eyebrow because when I invested. Seth in is a huge fan, by the way. And, and by the way, it's. It's fine to watch. I think it's curious. I understandably can't watch too much of it because I, it's I, I love the uh, not the to, drama. Not to, I love the drama, it's and awesome. I, I love to I love to watch the ideas because right. I'm I'm always thinking. I'm always trying to evolve different ideas, and it's nice to watch that. But there's a lot more behind the scenes than they, of course, than they show. Yeah, you, you know, the, the funny thing is, you never want to be a lender of last resort, and you don't want to be in a situation where somebody is desperate. Um, for me, entrepreneurs. There's nothing like it. The excitement, the energy, the creativity. Being able to be a part of that, it's an honor. It really is, as an investor, to have an opportunity to invest in a group that is putting their life and, and, and soul into what they're doing. You don't take too much from them. Um, I never took a majority interest in any company. I tried not to do an investment, and I try not to today make investments alone. You try to bring somebody else with a different skill set, because you never know everything. But you impart your experience. And there are mistakes that are made, and you try to avoid them in the future. Um, and that's what you do. You work on building companies and building people and building the legacy. So it's not just the founders, but the people down the road who are engineers or marketing people that want to start the next venture and the next one. Sometimes it's a couple of guys with a PowerPoint and a small monkey, you know, <laughs> and you back them. And it's nothing more than that. And that's the essence of it. It's with Elizabeth. She worked at and had put together a business plan and an idea that she wanted to execute in, in one area. The company that she was working with had no desire. They were too big. They forgot what it was like to be entrepreneurial. They said, you know what, we have budgets and P&Ls, we're behind schedule, whatever it is, and they decided to do something else. And Elizabeth said, well, they don't get it, but I do. I want to do this. And we worked on that together. And that's where the It's White Noise came from. It was mm. there, it was your idea. It's now, believe it or not, without an infrastructure, and without the politics and legacy and things, it's, it's opened up you know, the opportunity. It's not Shark Tank. It's not somebody going, I'm going to take 50% of your company or 80% of your company. If you don't do this or this or this, then we're going to take 100% of it. It's, it's not micromanaging that on the investment side. It's right. embracing and providing an ecosystem connectivity, whether it's somebody in marketing in a big company or somebody who knows how to code something here or a lawyer here or a finance person there. It's bringing your wealth of experience together to be able to do that. Um, so, and that's what we continue to do. And that whether that's It's White Noise or whether it's any of the, you know, the, any of the other companies that I get involved with. Mm. Um, again, it's looking for those entrepreneurs. It's what gets me out of bed in the morning and helps me kick the door down when I think about the day. 
I think that's and what gets you, you guys are, in many in many respects you could be you know slated as a modern day I mean without the um, shark heroic <laughs> um, connectivity a uh, Bruce Wayne you know I I'm just doing what I love to do with the people that I really enjoy doing it with. Mm. And it's not just Elizabeth. It's even sitting down and talking with you and, and Gabe a couple of months ago. Mm. And you guys were trying to figure out how to go forward and how to do things together. I didn't know you. I knew what your business was, but I'd seen you guys in other companies. Right. And we talked it through. And there was a good night of just you know sitting down and BSing about what you're looking for and, and having you guys figure out what you want. Yeah, you were a tremendous help. Absolutely. I, but you guys, it, it wouldn't have been anything without you guys having the passion. Mm. You know, you coming from one area, Gabe coming from another and coming together. I saw that. You know what? It didn't take a lot. Elizabeth and I saw that. It was like, it didn't take a lot to see that there's that all that energy there. Mm. And what do you do? So sometimes you spend an hour or three hours or five hours with somebody. Sometimes you put a little bit of money in. You know, we're not, it's not all altruistic. We're not doing it for a better place in heaven or any of that kind of stuff. But, you know, I was involved in the early days of the New York tech scene, uh, going back into the 90s. And even through a post 9-11 situation, being able to continue to invest and create jobs and give hope and, and create industry in a city, in my city, you know, I'm a kid from Brooklyn. I grew up in Brooklyn. That's what it's all about. And so it's where your passion is and where your drive is. And being able to share that with other people is, is really what it's all about in every way. Whether it's racing, whether it's going on rallies, whether it's you know, doing what Elizabeth is doing, it's what you're doing. Or, you know, I'll, I'll get, we were with somebody who had an energy drink for, um, a, a natural energy drink for preventing hangovers. <laughs> you know what? It's awesome. And the passion, we spent mm -hmm. five and a half, six hours with that person. We're looking to invest. Mm. You know, we're not looking to take 50% of their company or control of their company, anything like that. Right. You know, and if you work with great people, it's about a great market and it's about great management. Mm. And if you're able to add value to that, that's awesome. I know that's a long-winded way of saying it, but it's, you know, it, it is about the people, mm. first and foremost. That's funny. I, I watched another show, I'm, I'm sure you've seen it, MSNBC, Pro The Prophet, Marcus Lemonis, and that's what he always preaches. It's about the people. And he enjoys, really, changing people's lives. And you know, a lot of times he is rescuing businesses, but he's not so much rescuing it, he's just showing them how it should be managed. Because a lot of people just are unaware. Listen, you can write a check to anybody, they could take it, buy a ton of cars and say, I'm now a big car dealer. And they just piss it all away. And they're broke the next day. They, a lot of people just have poor management. I, I think you know, the, the number one reason for failed businesses is just poor management. You know, people are very tactical in many ways and meaning that they look at where the next thing is the next thing is and it, you know business is not checkers it's it's chess mm. you got to think five ten strategic 15, absolutely it's totally strategic and while i applaud people who work their tails off there there's you know the small businesses in the united states are the backbone of this country right That's where most people are employed most of the jobs are created and everything like that but a lot of folks are small mom and pop shops they put food on the table, they employ a bunch of people, but they don't have that, they don't, they don't make millions and millions of dollars. They're not living the easy life. When you look at entrepreneurs, um, and the ones that I look at, you know, you want to impart some of that experience. Mm -hmm. Like you said, you go and you talk to them, and so I back guys who've, who've failed two, three, four times. But you see something in them, and they learn something and something more every single time. Yeah, you only learn from a mistake. You never learn from victory. Yeah, and 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 being a, and sometimes if they can learn from my mistakes, that's awesome too. My nickel, absolutely every single day. We have a friend down on the West Coast who wanted to get into uh, investing in startups and with entrepreneurs, and and he made some big mistakes. And we've spent Elizabeth mm -hmm. six months uh, talking with him and going through what's gone wrong. Because mm. if you don't open your eyes to the mistakes you've made, and you're racing motorcycles and you're doing stunts and all the crazy stuff. Hollywood is just, you're a wild man out there, but you know, you didn't just all of a sudden fall off a you know, turnip truck and start doing this stuff. You know, you've got bumps and scrapes and bruises you from your history. <laughs> yeah, you gotta know how to fall and you gotta know how to get back up. You gotta know how to get back up. Because it can really take a lot out of you. Failure sucks. Mm -hmm. It really does. But if you have the And it puts a lot of you. fear inside you. You know, if, I mean, let's just say, let's just use motorcycle as a simple example. 
There's a lot of people who fall off a motorcycle and they say, that's it for me. Yeah. I don't need another broken leg. I don't need to spend another six months in a hospital. I'm done with this. So it takes a lot of courage and a lot of bravery to get back on and say, okay, I'm going to give this another attempt, even though I'm facing these risks, you know, um, medically or uh, pain, pain-wise. So I, I, I think that it's um, no, people with that kind of character. Just and, and T, you're right. If, you know, if the person falls off and they don't want to get back on again, that's great. That's awesome. Um, and if the person wants to get back on, and do, but don't do anything in a tentative way. Right. You know, either you're in or you're out. People who drive, you've been on racetracks, people who drive tentative, yeah. they're the biggest real... They, I, driving behind somebody who's going five tenths and is you know, going in and out and breaking and doing all these things because they're not really comfortable with what they're doing. Yeah, they are the biggest, biggest danger. danger. It's Absolutely. Nuts. It's ridiculous. And that's business too. If you have a leader, whether it's of a division or marketing or CEO of a company who does things in a tentative way, you're dead. You're mm. dead. You got to go. You got to go all in. You Absolutely. You really, really do. You have, you, have swim. To, yeah. you have to be willing to take risks and you have to take, you know, some of them calculated, some of them not calculated and you just have to jump in. Look, I, I do it every day and I assess risk and liability every day being a business owner. And that that's what it's all about. You you know, it's calculated risk. You're not doing stupid things. But and again, more the more experience you have of the people you have that you're surrounded by their experiences. And if you open your eyes and you listen and you see what's going on, you make yourself a better business person. You make yourself, your opportunities are greater every single day. Right, it's like constant um, adapt, adaptation yeah. and adjustment. And again, look, when I look at what Elizabeth has done, you know, she's been through a couple of, she has had a career in the arts. She's worked through marketing and, and branding. She worked in automotive and stepped up a couple of different ways. And then she had this great idea for something um, that was not embraced. Right, that you're probably. helping bring to fruition. Yeah, and that's that's the great, but that's, if you go back 20 years, it's what I did then too. Right, and speaking of that, I'd really like to get into, you know, a little bit broader of a history of uh, who you are. But that but I know, really is what I No, do. no, I know, I know, I know. But you did race Porsche. Yep. You have raced Ducati. Mm -hmm. Can we get into... You know, let, let, let's get into your cars. Yeah, let, let's get, get into, into your that. car life and how you got started. I mean, this is all about car lifestyle. And right. That's our podcast. is based on the automotive oh. industry. Do you really so, want to hear this? Yes, story? absolutely. Yes. <laughs> we want it. Okay. Oh. How about, how about I, I'll start off with, why don't we go through the, uh, the current... No, no, no. You're going to try to get the list of cars, right? Yeah, that won't happen. Yeah, no, that um, list. <laughs> this is not going to happen. But let me tell you. Oh, wait, about, wait, wait. Let's get started on the Porsche. You raced the Porsche. Let's RSR, start. Let's right? start on my mom. Okay. Okay. My mom. That sounds terrible. Let's start be, on my mom. And be gentle, T. Yes, <laughs> I am known to. Yeah. Well, this this will help calibrate. My mom passed away a number of years ago, and Seth she was always Dick. she was Sorry always she was always a car person, and. I remember the first car that she had that she loved was a Marlin. Now, people here don't know what a Marlin is. And people aren't. You're going to look it up. Rambler. Mm -hmm. had, AMC Rambler. Rambler before it was AMC. Oh. It was Rambler. Just oh, I didn't Rambler, know that. You know? And that's, that's a Jeep, right? Well, no. That was Rambler. And it right, was but it's like a pre SUV. Right. Yeah. Jeep, by the way, and let's go off on a rant here, that's been the only value in that brand forever. People always buy Chrysler for Jeep. They always did. They did it in the 60s, they did it in the 70s, in the 80s, and the 90s. Keep going on and on and on. You know, Mercedes bought it for that. Chrysler bought it for that. <laughs> the next person will buy it for that. That's that, that's that brand. Mm. That's that thing, that image, Jeep. You know, even the, even the Wranglers they have today are so much of the old stuff. You know, the front windshield still pops down right. and all that kind of stuff. It's it's pretty awesome, and that's a brand. Right, it's like the lineage stuff. of the 911. Same thing with the Jeeps. Yeah, and it's There's there. certain characteristics that have never changed. Right, and the 911 almost went away in, in, you know, in the 80s, but that fortunately didn't happen. But you know, my mom had this thing called a Marlin, and back in the day, you had the Mustangs, and they were the first pony cars, mm. first, and then you had the Camaros and Firebirds and things. But AMC tried their effort there, and they had this car we called it the skunk mobile it was a black car with a white stripe down the middle <laughs> you know what but she loved it it had a 327 big block not a small block but a big block and that was the first car that i remembered but we would drive every summer from new york from brooklyn to berkeley out to california with four kids a dog and a station wagon the first one being a rambler american then we really? You did cross-country then? Every year. Jesus. My parents were 
love that scene out there. I'll leave it at that. And um, and we did that. And then we, we jumped up to the Country Squire station wagon when I, I don't know where we got the money for it, but we ended up doing that. But it was, it was about cars and growing up around cars and loving cars. My mom loved cars. She was the first group of female uh, plumbers when the unions were sued to require women to be in the plumbers union. That's awesome. And yeah, and she was a commercial plumber. It wasn't like Madge who showed up at your door. She was working on commercial sites. And she was spit on and had her tires slashed and all that kind of stuff because guys didn't want women in the workforce. I love that against all odd stories. Yeah. And that, that was awesome. her. You know, she had a 240Z. You know, it was... it was The she, drift car. She, oh, 240Z. Z, right. We're, we're talking the fair lady, baby. We're talking the yeah. first gen Datsun. Right. You know... Um, awesome. And that was the kind of stuff that I grew up with. I always loved cars. Um, I was working on and changing oil when I was a kid. I worked in gas stations. Um, I bought junkers. My my first car, I used to just steal the keys, my dad's cars, <laughs> drive them with it. And I remember trying to get out, I was probably nine years old, trying to get out of the, out of the uh, driveway in his car that was a stick shift. And I did not know how to drive one. The emergency brake was on. It kept stalling and stalling and stalling when I was putting in reverse. I finally figured it out. Went around the block a bunch of times, and I get back, and my mom was in the driveway. Oh my god! And I that, that I remember that feeling today, and it was just like, oh. And my mom said, Shh, "Don't worry, I won't tell your dad." I was like, oh, thank God, <laughs> thank God. Um, but it progressed from that, and and you know, I I loved cars, and I fixed up cars, and there was this company called Earl Scheib. Yes, oh, yeah. ninety-nine dollar paint job. See, I'm a lot older than you. Nineteen ninety-nine. Wow. Upstow actually, you threw the guys who painted. 10 cars a day, threw them yeah. five bucks, they put a couple of coats on it, the cars would be shiny, you'd bring them out, you put a for sale sign on the street, sold. Make a little bit of money doing that kind of stuff. They're still in business. Are they really? Yeah. Where, what ever happened to Mako? They're still around. Yeah, oh, they are too? Yeah. Well, I think they're like 199. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's about the pay grade. Yeah. Actually, Mako was on uh, Undercover Boss not too long ago. Really? really? Yes. Wow. Another interesting show. That show is dope. But, you but know, wait, wait. Let's not interview. Let's not interrupt Andrew because he yes. went through his. I'm on a roll. Right, and I'm trying no, to hear no, it. No, no, no. But it, it was and it was about the cars. And when I was also my teens, um, you could go to the auctions in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, Bordentown and uh, Mannheim, which are mm. still around today. And if you had a transporter's license, you could buy cars and sell them. You mm. didn't have a dealer's license, and we buy cars, clean them up, do pinstriping. Do, you know, put in marble mystery oil, put in heavyweight, you know, whatever it was. Rotella, car, sure. And it, and sell these cars. You'd fluff and buff them and send them out into the real so world. So Andrew's a fraud. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> He's a fluffer and a buffer. Yeah. I, was a fluff. <laughs> we, I, I told somebody this story the other day. We bought this Hornet, an AMC Hornet. Wow. And yeah. it was this ugly blue. And put pinstripes on it, put hubcaps when you did... Put you made inside. it look good. You made it look good. Yeah. You made like a couple People buy with their eyes all the time. A couple of hundred bucks. So you're, you're, made you're also the maker of the lemon law. No. no <laughs> just, <laughs> we didn't sell these cars for enough money that people didn't know that they were, you know. I mean, they were, they were basic transportation. By the way, never had anybody complain. Never had anybody You know why he never out. had anybody complain? Because they didn't he, have cell phones. No, because he, he sold every car as is. <laughs> as is, on paper. He was smart. <laughs> I knew I had to drive those cars back from Bordentown. Right. And let me tell you, that wasn't a short drive. If it made it back, yeah. That was an adventure. That yeah. was an adventure. <laughs> the, and the one car that scared the crap out of me is I bought, I don't know why, I bought a Spitfire. Because it, it, it Triumph, Spitfire. Triumph, Triumph yeah. right? Yeah. <sighs> and that car made it back. On a wing and That's a cool little car, though. Did yeah, and yeah. I bought it for two hundred bucks. I sold it for like three fifty. I made one hundred and fifty bucks off of it. Right, which was a lot of money. Yeah, absolutely. Back then, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and that car was still running around the neighborhood for years after that. That's so cool. They they, I know they drove. Has that car like mint. Really, really. That's yeah. That car that I got was it was not mint. I remember that we had the top, <laughs> not the, but the mint. top was it was a it was a rag top. It was a you know you get the drive. But I love love that stuff. And we were talking on the car right over here. When I was younger, I'd go out to Bridgehampton and up to Lime Rock, and I'd race my street car there. But and I which go, was at was what an RX-7. So the first thing you ever raced was an RX-7. Yes, legally. <laughs> which which <laughs> RX-7? First gen. Oh, first gen, yeah. non-turbo. No, not turbos. But it had this little rotary. No, and yes, no torque, and no it horse. handled like a champ. And they Beautiful wound for like eleven thousand RPM. It was crazy. Yes, yeah. and we are in Freeport. Right. And the, what I remembered when there was a racetrack here in Freeport back then. 
That was like a half mile. It was oval, an oval. Yeah. Oval, yeah. Run what you brung, I think, at the day. Yeah, people yep. would they put demolition their... derbies, everything. It was Those awesome. are awesome. Yeah. We and, do that. and there was a place called. Let's Oregon. do it. Yeah. We can out east in River. We'll, we'll, we'll take we'll take your jeep. <laughs> oh, let's <laughs> not. <laughs> maybe we'll it's maybe we'll take Hollywood's jeep. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It'd be Wait so much more second. interesting in I, your nine eighteen. How about this? How about this? Seriously, let's just. I want to cut into this for a second. In Riverhead, at the racetrack, they do a demolition derby every single weekend. Take all you have to do, all you have to do, is bring some shit box. You bust out all the windows except mm-hmm. for the windshield. They have to weld the doors shut, and you can run any car you want in demolition I derby. Could, if I could dig up my transport's license, we can go out to I still have Mannheim one. and Gordon Town. Dude, let's do this. I say we go buy on Craigslist like some two, three hundred dollar cars each. Oh, I'll, awesome. I'll get them out there with my tow trucks and flatbeds. Got a better right idea. Got a better idea. Oh, you, you hear that, Seth? He's got a better idea than you. So just be quiet. Remember, no, no. Do you remember Jackass the movie? Yeah. 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 Okay, you get the car. Remember when they the rented rental. the car? And they took oh, it. The they rentals. Oh, the rentals. They yeah, dropped yeah. it off at the end. And this is you really going to get me into you trouble. Take the waiver for seven dollars. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so American Express for twenty five bucks. Yes. I can now, re- and I have zero liability. I can put the car into a brick wall. Up to one hundred and fifty grand. Okay. Oh, I'm sure they won't. Wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second. Like, this is going to be pretty premeditated now, since it's on this podcast. It's, a, it's up to one hundred and fifty grand. They cover Amex for twenty five dollars. We did, Let's we did this, yeah, we did this in St. Louis with rental cars. <laughs> did you? Yeah, my friend got screwed. He ended up paying for one, but he didn't have that. It does, and it, it does yeah, work. And it it does he, work. He paid for the extra insurance, but oh, he paid for the extra insurance. Yeah, and we still charge. We demolished the oh, cars no. and went American and Express. Played. It does work, and I had to put a claim in, so I know they do cover. Wow. <laughs> Let's so do it. We have a demo, a demolition derby in our future. We can fill those. Um, yeah, that'd be awesome. Fences Let's do up it. with some concrete and all. We're ready you know, to go. From, we want to relive our childhood experiences. I won't need, I won't I need, need any every day, extra weight personally. I'll be good. Yeah. <laughs> you need a counterbalance. <laughs> Liz, so you put me in my car. <laughs> I, don't wow. think, I don't think quarter balancing with Liz is wow. quite going to make it for you. But. Right, let's get back on track. Right, so let's go so back, back to, on track. Yes, is, so you're there, seven. So what I would do is I would take one tire, one wheel and tire that was a race tire and I, I put it in the passenger seat put one in the boot because it was a hatchback and tie two to the ceiling to the roof and drive out take them off change it to my race rubber go out with all the rich guys in their 911s and Porsches and, and you smoke and them so. right. you know I, I would win you know and with a lot less horsepower and just the passion and the so desire. what class were you in when you were in it was, SC, it was SCCA oh it was SCCA so, and that was the good old days and I don't even know if they run I mean it's and the it, funny well, thing Bridgeham is done yeah it's but you it know was, what it was sad I, I raced out there only a couple of times but I remember specifically one time Coming around, there comes like, another story, ladies and gentlemen. It was like turn three, and there were two hunters carrying a deer across the track. <laughs> it was legal to hunt on the track because they wanted to get rid of the deer out yeah. there. Well, that was, was a hazard. Have you ever been up and raced at Mount Treblanc? No. Mount Treblanc's up north of uh, Seth Montreal. can't even say that. <laughs> I have a tough time I, I saying thought, that. I thought, well. he, I thought he was talking about a, my well, pen. What about Hollywood? Can you say Mount Treblanc? No, no I can't. Okay. I'm not even going to attempt. I was, hoping, attempt. I was yeah. hoping no one would point me out. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Just so everybody knows, Andrew was right. I'm Earl Shive, and I'll paint any car, any color for 1995. No ups, no extras. You're actually you Seth Rose. <laughs> <laughs> so it's getting his car painted. But by 1970, it turned to 99.95. Okay. Thanks for that update, Seth. No problem. Yeah. That's so, <laughs> you be quiet now for the rest of the podcast. Done. <laughs> but in Mount Treblant, they have um, deer that run around on the track, and you got to watch that. That's um, crazy. Dangerous. Yeah. But, you know, it's super dangerous. dangerous. Oh, that's, that's sick. Jesus. I remember watching the Indy 500 one day when it was qualifying or something, where there was a rabbit that went, and it got sucked up yes. under the car. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. like yeah. 200 feet up in the air. Oh. Imagine hitting a deer. That's not yeah, you know, your car is so low to begin with, and then you're lower because you have coil lowers, and then you just break his legs, and his carcass comes in through the window and kills you. <laughs> it's a great day. Yeah. <laughs> well, that never happened. You could feed your family. Yeah, that's you good. Could. Oh, in West Virginia, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Got a bunch of people standing around the racetrack going, We're all talking dinner about how dangerous it is, and Liz face lights up, and she's like, you can feed your family. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that wide-eyed sort of optimism that I love in her. <laughs> Wait, so let's get back, because you know Andrew's very evasive when it comes to his history. So what do we oh, have? Up. So we, we were able to run, and if you fast forward, literally 20 20 years. Wait, um, did you get sponsored? How did you get into oh, racing? Oh, back then, no. I mean, you know, it was, you, 
you know, you were Can we get, like, a timeline of how you got to Porsche and how you well, were I running for them? I can't and... give you years because you still don't know how old I am. But you yes. can probably look that up. Um, no, there's no information on you. You're, you're like there's you're like a, uh, a government spook. They're videos. Yeah, you probably know that aliens are alive. You know where they live in the United you're States. You're not talking about it. Give, give me less he does, he does. <laughs> big time. The theorist, you're by the, the way, worst. by the way, Andrew is extremely evasive when you ask him, "Do aliens exist? Do you believe in aliens?" Go ahead, ask him, Seth. We've already established this on the ride over here without <laughs> you in the car. Oh, you shit, you're a cheater. You're a cheater. So what did, cheater. what did you have to say? There's no such thing as aliens. Get the fuck out of here. We actually didn't have that conversation, as far as you know. Oh. No. But her sister... Is an alien? Maybe. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> She's from Uranus. <laughs> well, that's a big place. That's a, <laughs> just got to watch out for the Klingons in here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so wait, so how did you get from um, an R7 to a Porsche? You don't, actually. Okay. And, you know, it's like how they say, you know, how do you get to Har Carnegie Hall? Yeah. Practice. Practice. Mm. So, you know, that was a life I didn't have any real money. It's a car I drove on the street. It was literally would break your teeth. The R7, correct? Yeah. You okay. would break your teeth in those cars. Um, be just driving down streets and wherever it was. And, you know, I had to sell the car. And, but I had done some things. I had restored an old Corvette and sold that because going to school, I needed the money and just working, working full time. Mm. Nobody, like with Elizabeth's background, her parents were both civil servants. You know, we didn't have money growing up. Mm -hmm. I think everybody around this table is, is from the same. Not Seth. He's Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> I was not born rich, if that's what you're asking. No, no. He was also not born poor. No. My, if that's what you're asking. You can, listen. Uh, yeah, listen. I'm listening. My father was an accountant. Yeah, I know. That's a terrible job. And my mother was a librarian. There you go. Queens College. She owned the library. Though. <laughs> <laughs> my grandfather, however, <laughs> truth that's be right. told, truth be told, my grandfather and my grandparents, my mother's parents, lived in the same apartment for 57 years Where? in Woodside, Queens. Awesome. Okay, rent controlled. I and think guess who I, Woodside is owned by now? I think when they left, their rent <laughs> was like true. The, the rent was like sixty one dollars a month. I mean, it was like nothing. Crazy. And after my grandfather passed away, we then found out that he did have a windfall of money, but he lived through the depression and never spent a penny of it. I, yeah. I had a, a great uncle in Brooklyn who, funny enough, he also. You wouldn't know. He had a yeah. fortune when he passed away, but he would unscrew the light bulb when he left the room. <laughs> yeah, same thing. That's gangster. Because he, he, flipping the switch off, he still didn't believe there wasn't current going through. He's right. He's going to get charged yeah. for it, and he would unscrew the light bulb. But that's the ways of the o the older generations. Yep. But that a lot of that... My father was pulling two-ply toilet paper apart. He was like... Yeah. We didn't even use toilet paper. Oh, shit. That's <laughs> the fucking problem. Man. My grandmother told me about using an Don't alcohol. shake Andrew's hands. Seriously. <laughs> old, habit, uh, old habits die hard. Shit. I was saying um, my grandmother used an outhouse. Mm. That's, re that's real. That's West Virginia for That's you. real. <laughs> Indoor plumbing. Andrew, Andrew has a, I don't know, $35,000 Rolex Daytona on and a shitty hand. <laughs> Just a stainless steel watch, man. Could be stainless. Could be platinum. I don't know. Yeah, I don't mean. You a baller, son? No, no. But that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, you know, with they, his Puma sneakers on from yeah, ten years Puma. ago. <laughs> you know what? Not Puma. He makes fun of my Puma here, sneakers. Here. So let me yeah, but hold on, hold on. Let me no. hear your yeah, but those are his. cool, though. But those no, are cool. Oh, those are cool. You know why these Bro, are the good. ones that you had on? Not cool. <laughs> like honestly, the Manolo style. No, no, <laughs> those are not cool. No, those are so not cool. And I was like, oh, they're so not cool. I was like, cool, yo, what, cool. you work in a hospital? And he was like, no, what are you talking about? I was like, why do you have nurse shoes on? He had the Ferrari Pumas. Oh, you know, except like, they're on male, sale all the time. Who they're did? always on sale. Manolo from oh, Empire Boys. Yeah, I was like, I don't have the Ferrari. Pumas. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> don't go there. No, you had like the whack ass right, so, wannabe. Right, let's get Beastie back. Boys. No, but these put, it's funny you tell the story. When I was, I think I was six years old. I, wanted a pair of Pumas, sure. and all my buddies were sure. getting them, whatever. My mom said, go do what you need to do. I cleaned gutters and raked and did this and that, and I bought a pair of Pumas, and they were blue suede Pumas that made your socks blue Some if blue. they rain. Mm -hmm. They don't do that these days, I found out. 
but that's why you I found out. Something. Wait, let's I just these say gotten, these gotten wet. Every one of your guests here have on, you know, free T-shirts from the given parties, and you guys are wearing Ralph Lauren polos. Oh, 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 oh. I'm just exhibiting my Jewish side, please. I would have wore a Ralph Lauren polo too. <laughs> If I would have known about this hole. I know. Apparently, I gave Hollywood a car lifestyle shirt and it has a hole in it. Looks but like it could be cheese. because he lives in the hood and he got shot at. You know, you never know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't live in the hood, by the way. You yeah. Missed. No, you know. I used to. Yeah, well, it would be the hood compared to, like, you know, the Jewish neighborhoods of Woodside. That's like the hoodies. Right? <laughs> the hoodies. <sighs> the hoodies. That's right. Wait, right, what, so what do you got on, Liz? <laughs> just a shift sector. Um, yeah, thanks. thanks. We're talking about kicks. What are you oh, doing? Converse. Wearing, I'm wearing Converse. She's got some chucks, man. Yeah. Some chucks, man. Oh, yeah. Hi, Tom. You need some Jordans. You need to oh. really make it pop. I don't know if I can pull off no, some you Jordans. No, you could. You pulled off an illest hat with a pom-pom on the top of it <laughs> in the middle of the winter. You could totally pull off Jordans. Absolutely. This illest moment is brought to you by... <laughs> 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 That's good, Andrew. <laughs> Wait, so, no, but so, yeah, so, so just the fast forward is that you know I I worked hard. I had a lot of jobs when I was a kid. And was working full time for most of the time, even in grad school, you know. And and you work hard, and then you start making a little bit of money. And I was very fortunate. And my love, my passion, was, was cars. And right. when I was when I was twelve years old, I worked in construction. And this is one of those those moments. And we were sitting around at lunch, as you did just in the summertime, and reading the daily news and there was a picture an article about a car that was stolen mm. and it was a Lamborghini Miura and, Sick. A, and a picture a black and white and I looked at that picture and I, I was blown away and I turned to the guy next to me and I said someday I'm going to own a car like that you weren't and, lying and he looked at me and he said you'll never be able to afford it and That's that the motivation story. What, that, seriously and I've told that story to a number of people over the years and it still gets me little pissed and a little whatever and I don't remember who the guy was and if I walked by him on the street I probably wouldn't recognize him but that was one of those things and so when I started making a little bit of money and having some disposable income you know that was my passion some people did you know art I some people a, did drugs yeah you know yeah. what and that's there's that's all true. kinds of that's true. ways to but for me it was of course yep. and, and, and the but it was about the iconic stuff for me Mm. You know, whether it's the Mirror or the Gullwings or the old Speedsters or the 68 Camaro we have. You know, that for me was an icon. Right. And, and, and it's nostalgic. And it's great, but it's mm. passion, you know. But every one of our cars is, is there for a reason. If we have cars that overlap in function, in our minds, Elizabeth and I, we'll not keep them. Mm -hmm. And that's the funny part. So people say, what's your favorite car? It's like, it depends on the day. Mm -hmm. right. If we want to do donuts and quarter mile burnouts, we're going to do our 68 Camaro with a supercharged LS2, the, you know, C5 subframe and a Tremec and 411S. And we're just going to fly around and do crazy stuff. You know, if we want to go out and just have a lot of fun, we'll go out in the 57 Speedster. We'll go for long drives. We'll go for four or five or 600 miles. Um, sometimes it's the 918. We want to be totally... The, that car is just an amazing car in so many ways, but we did the Gold Rush Rally. The first part was done in our Carrera GT, a totally analog car. Mm. So, But the mood struck us, and we said, you know what? We're going to do the run from San Diego to Vegas in the Carrera GT. And we loved it, and it was awesome. And, and then you switched over to the 918? Yeah, and we loved it. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. And we were going through you know, the desert at, at some you know, reasonable speeds, and... Um, it was it was awesome, but again, it depends. We're gonna we're very very lucky, and you know this the end of this month we're gonna be over in Germany picking up our GT3 RS and GT4, and we've been on the road so much we haven't been able to do that. I mean, who gets to do you, that? You, stuff? You'd always send me. I mean, it's really not that big of a deal. I'll sit you with the what? pigs and the chickens. It's awesome. I don't give a shit. <laughs> but you know, but if we get back and we find out that we use the same car for the same thing, two separate, we'll get rid of one. So, you know, it's. The Carrera GT strikes a core, the Speedster does, the, the Gullwing does, the 918 does, the Desmo Sedici that I ride does, sometimes it's the V-Rod. It all depends, and, and it depends on your mood and what you're doing, and, and that's, that's it. So, I mean, but it's always been about the passion. I've done well as far as capital appreciation is concerned with cars, probably because 
It was about what do you love? Mm. And maybe I'm not that unusual. You know, the, the, goal, the old Gold Wings or the old Porsches. People love those cars. So did I. Or your McLaren F1. Everybody loves those cars. You know, you're, you, but the, the pricing has gone through the roof. But we're not sellers of a lot of right. these cars. Well, I, I, I've recently seen prices start to come down a little bit. On what? Um, on Porsche in, in particular. Oh. So funny thing, what we're seeing and what I'm seeing is we've got a 73 RS. And we saw that, I mean, we bought it for not much and it's gone up. It's, it's sort of plateaued, mm -hmm. but it's at a ridiculous price now. Correct. The money is now going into trying to find it. People want to buy a classic Porsche. They're going in at seventy-five, a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars, and not to be, you know, snooty about Certainly. it. Certainly, but that's the entry point: fifty, a hundred, two hundred grand, and those prices. The cars that were fifty are now a hundred. Ones that were a hundred are one fifty and two hundred. You're seeing a lot of appreciation mm -hmm. in the lower end of that, mm -hmm. but that's a product of the market. And, and when well, the when the shit hits the fan, it's always what somebody is willing to pay. You can price a car. You can have a McLaren F1 and say it's ten million. That doesn't necessarily mean the car is worth ten million. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're selling it for ten million. It's what they're asking for. You can ask what you want, but right. at the end of the day, there's a, it's an old what guy you told to me it's it for. What the price of the thing is what it ends up, what it will right. bring, what it sells for, yeah. and and that's that's it. But I think as you get to the higher end of the, um, when you get to the higher end of the scale, the market is more mature. The people are more intelligent. The data and True. the analytics that go into it, like with Haggy. People are looking at this stuff. So when you're spending a million dollars for a, a, an RS or a million and a quarter, that's it. You're getting to that point where you have a lot of smart people in who are, who are not going to overpay. When you're looking at passion purchases and things like the 30-year rule or the 20-year rule, it's like when you were a teenager, you always wanted that car and you got the disposable income to get it, there's a bubble. Mm -hmm. When you have that kind of velocity of capital going into the market, it's like anything else. You know, but the smarter people are at the top end of that. Mm -hmm. But it was like art, you know, in the in the 60s and 70s, buying a Picasso for a few hundred grand or a few right. million, you would have been brilliant because you could, they, they're getting 100, 150 million dollars for those pieces. It's insane. Oh, absolutely. And, and also, by the same token, years ago, people didn't drive their cars. And a lot of these cars that you're even talking about driving, people didn't drive them. They treated it like artwork. They kept it in their garage. Their garage was perfectly manicured. They Climate had, controlled, right? They had these crazy bubbles you used to drive your car into. They like still do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they still do. And we, but we drive the crap out of right. it. I mean, you I drive them. I drive my cars. And that's the beauty of it, though. If you can afford to buy it, own it, and drive it, it actually, you know, it doesn't really hurt the value It's the that utility much. value. A car, we, we talk about the serial number and all that stuff. If you do the right thing and you restore a car, um, and some of our old cars are, you know, we drive them all over the place. But when we did the paint on them, we made sure they were stripped down and they were done perfectly. Right. So that when you redo it, and I was in one of the shops that I do some business with, does a high-end collector's cars, and he has an old uh, Testarossa in there. So not, not from the Miami Vice days, we're talking the 50s. Oh, I didn't know that there was a previous model. That was the seminal, you know, the redhead, which is what the Testarossa name comes from. 57, they had a couple of prototypes in 58. Mm. And he drove it, and he was in to get the car painted, because it had road rash on it. That right. made a big statement to me. Mm. And so, you know, you drive the cars. We talk about the 918. People are like, oh, put a clear on this, do a wrap, and do all that stuff. I'm like, you know what? There's a patina. You got a rock chip. Big deal. We're driving it. You know, I'm not going to stick it in a garage and rub it with a diaper and say, wow, look at what I got. But if you are get off on doing that stuff, cool. You know, a lot of the Desmo Sinichis are in people's you know, living rooms. Yeah. And they're, they're on hard. Display, yeah. They are. And if that's what you love mm -hmm. and you're too scared to ride them. Exactly. But you well, love looking at them. That's my boy, two of them. One to ride and one to hide. Yeah. And mine, I just straight out the dealer chopped it up. Yeah. Just because I knew what I wanted to do with it. You know, I'm a stunt I, that bike out. Like, yeah. people looking at me like, you bought a Ducati and you're going to what? But it's what I want to do. Yeah. And so the main me. reason I did it is because everyone's like, you can't. I was like, mm -hmm. why not? I'm gonna do it. It's like who's gonna stop me? I want to do it. I think yeah, but you're a visionary in that in that respect. Like you do, you're not afraid to go against the grain if you. No, but it's see like the what vision. you said earlier. You know, if you want to do something, you gotta take chances. You go all yeah, out. I got this. Go with conviction. Yeah. The exotic yeah. car world has definitely evolved with more people driving their cars. As you saw in Gold Rush. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the owners of Gold Rush, who's a friend of mine, Ben. He drives his Bugatti cross country, no problem. 
and he's painted the car before, and he's <coughs> done the interior. Not that everybody agrees with everything that he does to his cars. Yeah, but, but that's, that's awesome. That's individuality, and if you can afford to do it, God bless, do it. Do what you can. And we're, yeah, we're getting... We're Meanwhile, getting, we yeah. still haven't heard how Andrew got to racing the Porsche RSR, which I am dying to hear. <laughs> One day I woke up and I said, gee... I mean, I probably probably would do all the kind. The funny thing is, is I had been bouncing around in a Boxster, mm. and a lot of people thought. And by the way, which is still one of the best handling cars on the planet. Period. Mm. And a buddy of mine who made self-made lots of zeros behind his num his, his numbers. He asked me one day. He says, "You like Porsches? What do you What do you think I should buy?" I said, buy a Boxster. And he's like, I'm not buying that car. I said, drive the low, one. The low-budget Porsche. Drive one. Yeah. And we're doing some things with uh, with Barrett Jackson. So Craig Jackson is also a Bugatti owner who was on the one leg of the Gold Rush. Um, we ended up doing, he, he talking to a couple of his marketing people. And the guy said to me, yep, same story. And he doesn't have a lot of money. He's on the other end of the spectrum. He says, I want to buy a Porsche. What should I buy? And he's talking about the Cayman or maybe an old 911. I said, what about a Boxster? I said, get away, get, a, get past that image issue. Right. You know, the Barbie car and all that stuff. Drive that car. And he did. And he bought it. The other guy loves it. It's great. It's fantastic. But that's, that's the thing. You can, it's a passion. It's, it's, you can buy a used Boxster for, you know, 15, 20, 30,000 bucks. They're pure cars. Absolutely. They're light. They're awesome. They're visceral. They're all that kind of stuff. And I would just... I went back to Lime Rock after a, a long time off of racing, and I played around a little bit, and one of the guys up there was like, wow, you're pretty good at this. And I figured, okay, they just want to suck me into it, which they did. Mm. Um, and I ended up trying to figure out what I wanted to do, vintage or something current, and I ended up building uh, a Boxster and mm. driving that and doing very, very well. And then had an opportunity to jump up. And I didn't go from, you know, one class and to the next, I just said, screw it, and just jumped up. And that so you really bought the Porsche RSR? Oh, yeah, you had to buy even Even factory, you know, there, there are works drivers today, and they have a couple of works teams. Those are works drivers where you get, where they support everything. Those like the Flying cars. Lizard cars? No, those no. are not works cars. Okay. They have a few, were you at Daytona this year? No, sir. Years? Have you been to one of the 24-hour races or no, Sebring sir. or 12? I know of them. You, you, but I've never been. You you might want to go down there. Sebring is awesome from a couple of perspectives. It is one of the hardest tracks on the body, on the equipment. A 12-hour there is like 24 anyplace else. Mm -hmm. It's an old airstrip. It's concrete. It's crazy. It's nuts. The car's around the last turn. You're bouncing around. You think you're going to go in the wall. Whatever. But then there's also turn, Elizabeth, what you talk 11, about? Right. Turn 11. Turn 11. <laughs> where they do beer slides and crazy yeah. crap I mean, and the animal have husbandry. People married there and chicken fights and there's like lazy boys on top of RVs and it's just a really ridiculous, crazy, wild, wild and out. Like, I don't know. It's ridiculous. That's right. turn 11. Yeah. And that's the fun thing. And if you're on the racetrack, you would even, you would never know that's happening. Mm. You would just never know. I mean, you're just at speed and you're focused and doing all those kinds of things. All the blow-up dolls on TV that you see in the background when they pass by, you're like, what <laughs> <Yeah>. is that? <laughs> it's like in a basketball game when you see the guys behind the basket when they're waving all that stuff. Oh, right, right, right. Kind of distracted. You're really thinking that cool about son? That's it. That's awesome. doesn't work. It doesn't work, though. Mm. It doesn't work when you're focused on this stuff. But there are a couple of works drivers every year, mm -hmm. and they have a couple. So you look at Patrick Dempsey, who raced at Le Mans. He, came, he and his team came in second. Not a works, not a works car. Mm. The works team are those folks who are just from the factory. There are 15 plus that are in the pits just for that car. And they're all, we went to Daytona when, when they came back to Daytona and won last year. And it was everybody from Germany. Mm. There, wasn't, yeah. there wasn't anybody stateside. Nobody, well, they all spoke English, but their native tongue was German. And mm. those are the works drivers. The great thing about Porsche, and we know a couple of the people that were involved with the cup racing, and you probably know a little, I don't know if you've done any cup racing at no. all, um, is that they came up with a great idea, and they said, we're going to build these cars, and we're going to get a bunch of people together, and they can afford to do it. We're going to support it. It's going to be cash flow positive. It wasn't going to be that we're going to support it and do it for these, but they actually built a real business model around hmm. it. That's why Porsche, I think, has won over 30,000 races. What? Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow. Because they democratized, in a weird way, racing. 
Mm. So if you're driving a Cayman or a Boxster, or we've been to races where it's not vintage stuff, but you got guys who are still running 911s from you know the 70s and 80s and 90s, and these guys are really good and they're competitive with the current stuff. Mm. You know that's that's really where it's about and that's where it's at. And for me, you know, we talk about the relationship that I'm fortunate to have and Elizabeth has with Porsche, you know, from the board level. Um, it's it's born of that passion. It's not because of racing, it's not because of anything. It's you know, it's because of who we are and how we do what we do. Mm. It's the relationships that we've had over the years. Sure. You know, to the point where some people would ask me even within Porsche, you know, how do you know these guys? And we kind of look at each other sometimes like, we kind of know them. What do you mean? Right. It's like, well, how do you know these people and how do you have those relationships with them? And it's about respect um, and, and admiration on some levels, but it's about being a good person and doing stuff like we were talking about the other day. You know, when you guys sat down with us and mm-hmm. talking through the issues and the problems, it doesn't matter whether you're a Porsche, it doesn't matter whether you're car lifestyle, or it doesn't matter whether you're this person that has this hangover drink. Um, you know, there's certain people you just you want to talk to and be involved with. Right. And it's racing, too. You know, one thing I learned is in racing, in most instances, if you have a problem with your car and you need a part, you can go down it's to the paddock. relationships. Yeah. <laughs> but most of the time, if you, if, even if it's a competitor of yours and you're, you know, beating the crap out of each other all weekend long, they'll give you something if they got a spare. Mm. If you're a good person. Go to Monterey last year, and I won't mention names. But there was one guy who's got a bunch of cars he takes care of and a, and a guy who was racing and he had an issue with his caliper. And there were others out there. Mm-hmm. Nobody would give him the part. Huh. They wouldn't do it. Because wow. the guy he was associated with was not a good guy. And, and that killed it for him. And it killed the guy's weekend. And he didn't know. Mm. He didn't know that story. He was like, I don't understand why nobody's giving me that part. Mm. You know, and it's... Speaking of current projects, right? You guys are very familiar and good friends with Nakai San of RWB. You know, yep. we'll turn that over to Elizabeth. You know, it's not every day that when you celebrate your birthday that Nakai comes out with a cake um, yeah. for you. So, you know, friends, I mean, I'll, I'll throw that one over. Right. To you guys went to Japan and you hung out with him and you're going to be building the RWB Brooklyn, correct? That's, that's, that's what it is. And it'll be the first one on the East Coast or... Um, I think it's the first one in New York. I'm first not one sure in New York. Yeah, I think oh, there are a couple. Why, okay. why don't you tell us what the yeah? Why don't you give RWB us, Brooklyn? What does T throw us? What RWB is and what you know of RWB? Jesus, put me right on the spot, <laughs> Nakai. Don't listen to this. Um, I know that it stands for Raw Welt Big Griff. I know Raw Welt stands for Raw World, Rough World. Um, the Big Griff. I forget. I know I looked it up, but I forget what it means. Um, I know Nakai Sun is a visionary when it comes to building one-off custom Porsches that are not only aesthetically pleasing but are functional on the racetrack. I know he um, he chooses whose car he wants to build, um, as far as I know, and he makes all these um, modifications to you know to widen the track of the car and you know the body panels. Does he do performance upgrades as well? I'm not positive on that. Or is it more aesthetic? He's, he's, he's the, you know, aesthetician, as they say. He he does everything himself. So he's like a performance DP of today's world. Yeah. But he'll cry. He's the one. When you see a build, which is why we want to do a document. Wait, hold on. Doc- Hollywood DP is um like a director of photography. You know, not a <laughs> double, double penetration. Yeah. So. <laughs> Just thought I'd help Hollywood out. On that, on that note, um, but what Nakai does is he he envisions the project. He works with you, and but he does everything. Yeah, he has zero he, employees, right? He right. He paints like little spots. He bolts on. He cuts. He does he the does, welding. I'm actually. Does, I just googled it. I'm looking at the pictures. It's just a little googled late. RWB Porsche, just to see some of it. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And he's in. He's in Japan. In Japan, which mm-hmm. you know. He has to personally fly to you to build the car. He does not let someone else build the car for him. Gotcha. So he's building this in Japan or he's building it stateside? So he's going to build it in New York because it's from New York. It's called the Brooklyn, um, which happens to be a friend of ours. We're probably going to do it at AI Design, which is... always use my shot. I don't mind. um, (laughs) (laughs) Seth's like, come on over. 
for the small yeah. fee of. <laughs> and your shop is? My shop is Art of Rap. Shameless and, plug. And the Art of Rap does what exactly? Yeah, we've plugged it many times, but the Art of Rap is a vinyl. Uh, we do vinyl wrap. We do clear paint protection, detailing, paint correction, restoration of paint, um, all sorts of electronics, similar to AI, but not as invasive as them. They, they've kind of cornered the market at, at very custom applications. Um, very meticulous work. But yeah, but uh, hopefully by the time this podcast airs, we'll be moved into a new location, which is actually a little uh, bigger and nicer. Nice. Excellent. So we, are, we haven't uh, chosen a shop, but you're certainly in the running, although... Um, See that? You're in the running, Seth. You're I'm in the, the running. running. But we, we do have a favorite son, just with AI, because they've done work, and uh, Matt's done it. a lot of work. Like I said, their work is second to none. I've seen it. So. They're, just, they're, they're amazing. Their work is ridiculous. You know what? We should bring Holly there, Hollywood there one day. They did some work on like shop. Desmo. That's when I, in yeah. no, no, it's no, like it's in Tuckahoe. Tuckahoe. Yeah. Just, you oh, know okay. where the um, Yonkers Raceway is? Like literally right by there, oh, okay. not that far away. But this is like a sight to see. This is like so. This is interesting. You're going to be contracting him. He's going to be coming stateside, and then he's going to build out which car. So we're going to base it on a 964 chassis. Cool. And, what years? Um, what year? You know, it's um, doesn't really matter, does it? We're finding we haven't found the one we want yet. Oh, we, we were considering with with all disclosure, we were going to do we were going to go a little over the top on the build. Mm -hmm. We're going to do a four-liter, air-cooled, naturally aspirated, high-revving. Dope. Um, weren't sure about the drivetrain and whether we're going to do like a sequential, but do it with pneumatic shifters like in the old Sick. RSR. Sick. And do some work. And, and so that was one that is... Yeah, go that route. Go that route. That, I mean, that's <laughs> one of the considerations. It's funny because the end of the month, we're going to be in Germany with a guy who does some spectacular builds just like that. Oh, that's your fr your friend. Lightspeed? He's, yes, he, Lightspeed. He, yes. Well, Remember that good. 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 <laughs> that pull that one out of your the deep dark Hell yeah. regions of your uh, gluteal <laughs> folds. Um, <and> Jesus. <laughs> we, uh, you should be writing erotic novels. <laughs> Gluteus <laughs> folds. Fifty Shades of T-minus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Holy shit. He's got more like a, he has more like a hundred, but anyway. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so when you were saying that that's why DP sort of rolled off your tongue like that? Yeah, no, yeah, it rolls right the fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, so the light speed guy is, is interesting because he does it on the other end of the spectrum, which is it's less about the over-the-top cosmetics with, right. the, with the aerodynamics and stuff. And all about performance. It's all about performance, and it's all about 3D printing and body panels and carbon fiber and, you know, out drilling stuff out. Like, Roger Penske was famous for in the late 60s, early 70s, and the Trans Am stuff, they would dip, they would acid dip the bodies mm -hmm. to lighten them up. Those things were... That's so smart. It was insane. They, they finally figured out why their cars were so much light. They were lighter on the top, and he was able to put the weight from a racing mm -hmm. perspective in the right places. Like you and uh, mm -hmm. Hollywood and everybody here understands is it's not about the weight per se. It's about placement. Unsprung weight, putting things, center of gravity, polar moment of inertia. Really, honestly, that's genius. Like that. And they did that. So he's, he and I are talking what he actually said would be his halo car. But it would be a sub two thousand pound, five hundred horsepower, naturally aspirated air cooled, but a car that's just singer esque in build, like the singer, right. but not an opulent singer, um, but something that is just functional, purpose built. Yeah, yeah. I think you should take. I think you should take out Ken Block and the Unicorn with this Porsche. <laughs> <laughs> Ken Block, if you're listening, you're in trouble, bro. Ken Block, by the way, who was at Goodwood? We just saw him at Goodwood. We just saw him at Goodwood. Who right. put on an incredible show. I don't know if you For know. Lord March, right? Lord March. He had the Hornicorn horn there. Yeah, he, he did. Yes. And he was the first one ever to do donuts, or at least donuts with permission. No, he did not have permission to do donuts uphill. They said, because it's oh, uphill. uphill. Okay. So what did he do? So downhill. he did it in front of the stands and downhill. He did it on the downhill. And downhill. <laughs> so he got the loophole like that. He's like, oh, we can't do the uphill donuts on the uphill. Okay, we'll do it on the downhill. But it was... Um, Goodwood this year was spectacular. It's it's grown, but it's just been more inclusive. This year, what blew me away was not only did you have Ken Block and Mad Mike with his... Oh, motor, Mad Mike was there? Yeah, yep. with his three rotor Dude, he, blah, blah. He builds sick cars also. You know, you talk about rotary engines. I don't know where he comes up with this crap, but he does it himself. Yeah, he has a four rotary RX4. Four rotor, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah, a, it's, it's actually an MX-5. 
Wow. The the bodies in yeah, X5. So it's a, I believe it's a it's a Miata, Miata. frame frame, but the body. I'm is pretty sure frame. that that four rotor was built on um, the specs of the Mazda 787B race car. I think we're gonna look that one up. Look it up. Look it what up. are we looking up now? Mad, Mike? Mad, Mike? Gave extra Mad four, Mike. four, four rotor. rotor. Look up Miata what? MX5. No, not Miata MX. MX5. Oh, Miata MX5. Yeah, that's what I said. Really? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry I didn't know it was sorry, dude. Sorry, dude. Yeah. I had to take sorry. That out he oh, edited oh all my stories. It's a, it's so he knows. Turbo four rotor, 1200 horsepower. <laughs> Holy mother of God. Yeah. yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> but was awesome. And if you check out the Instagram page of It's White Noise, or even mine, my little one, is Richard Petty. Mm -hmm. So was amazing. That Goodwood. He's Richard a fucking legend. Petty was there with his Superbird. His right, Plymouth Superbird, the blue one that won, that hadn't been run. One year Instagram. Hadn't been yeah. run in 30 years. He was sitting on the, the door or something. Oh, I did. So I, I went up yeah, to yeah, him. Yeah, I seen that. I seen so it here's a guy incredible. who is a legend. Living legend, With absolutely. a car that's a legend. Legend, That hasn't right. been run in 30 years. That he's going to go up, do the uphill. And he's sitting there, and you can't hear shit. You, you really, And he's standing, getting ready to go onto the grid. Things you know, got a cam and a crank and everything. It's just like, you can hear the cam, it's so lumpy. It's like, blah, 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 blah. And I That's yell awesome. over to Elizabeth, I'm like, come here. And I said, Mr. Petty, would you please take a photo? And he just stopped everything he was doing. Stopped yeah. everything he was doing. He made all doing. the people pushing the car and everything. Because he knew who you were, he was like, oh <laughs> shit. He was like, oh, that is what, that's why I said, oh shit. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> no one else went up to his car, no one else is allowed close. He, he was motions me over. Too, right? Yeah. Yeah, he was, he was that was, it out there. It was so awesome, but that's the kind of stuff you see. But that's it's dope cool. to have, you know, the two contrasts of Ken Block and Richard Petty at a somewhat Stuffy event like Goodwood? Not anymore. I will tell you, the last two years, like I said, it's more inclusive now than it's ever, ever, ever been. And I, you get I'm sure that's everybody. through the friendship of Ken Block and Lord March. It's, it's, that, is, that is part of what's gotten them there. Mm. It's that kind of embracing different cultures, different attitudes. We have a buddy there who does the Drift All Stars. Okay. Um, and the, it's the European Drift. It's the European Drift, like a Formula D for right. Europe. And, you know, reaching out to a new demographic and seeing all the people in the stands. You saw six-year-olds, eight-year-olds, 12-year-olds, 15-year-olds, as well as 60-year-olds. You saw people, you know, going gaga over the old 917 Porsches and some of those things. But you saw people going nuts over Mad Mike's building. I mean, we were seeing everything from Sterling Moss come up the hill to a Nissan Juke on two wheels, take what? the entire course. Sterling Moss was in his 722, the car that won... Uh, the, the SLR, Lilia, right? SLR 720. Yep. He drove it up the hill. And if you didn't know, Elizabeth actually drove at the um, Salzburg ring in the 658 car. Which yeah, Elizabeth Fangio's has a really car. hard life. Yeah, we, no, we the are aware. Yeah. Do, you know, the do you know what the 722 stood for? No. It's the time of day that they left the starting line. Wow, that's cool. People didn't know that. It's the oh, so 658 car? and the Millimilia. Oh, okay. So the 722? Mercedes-Benz SLR 722? 658, which Elizabeth drove in the, um, on the uh, Salzburg ring, which was Fangio's car, the same race. Juan Fangio. Yeah, Juan, Juan Manuel. Manuel, that's and, it. From? Brazil? Argentina? There you go. Really? Yeah. Oh. I know your Thank mind God goes I know to, some kind your of mind goes to like, Brazil all the time. I yeah, I guess it's the Art and Santa thing for me. I thought it was going to say the, West Virginia, but anyway. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> but Goodwood was awesome for, for, for all those reasons. You had, for Elizabeth's, for its white noise, had a lot of the photographers that we knew, right. but hadn't really spent time with. Right. Her. And you know, once you talk Did you guys bring a car there? Not this year. Oh. So you just went to attend? We got a call to um, to go to the Goes benefit, as a, yeah, a guest. To, as a guest to the ball, yeah, which was also a mind blower. They had R Ryan was out there, no? No, Ryan was here doing Formula D. Actually, he won. You he know, came in third. You this, know, this you past know, week. In okay. he came in first the, the event before, before okay. and third the event before that. That's awesome. So he's right now number one in the point standings for Formula I D. I was looking for you on the podium because he had his crew and he put a post on Instagram. Ryan did about uh, thank you, and I was looking for your smile. Right, I actually day. actually wasn't there for Saturday. Gabe got married. And it was his wedding. Gabe, so we, who is the founder of Carlisle. Gabe, say hello, Gabe. 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 Yeah. 
Oh yeah, no, Gabe's in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> right, so he's actually on his honeymoon right now, but yeah, I didn't have an opportunity to see Wait, Ryan. On is, is there a reason you can't uh, go to New Jersey? Oh guys? yeah, yeah. Actually, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got four. I got four wanted. tickets the same day. <laughs> he's wanted uh, in New Jersey, right? Which oh, I never paid the tickets. So strictly vehicle and traffic incident. That's correct. The um, uh, the thing with the, well, that, that, the kids the, and everything that's over, right? That's gone. Keep like it the, up, dickhead. <laughs> the, the sheep. The sheep. <laughs> oh, that was actually. We kid. are not oh. talking to Brian Solomon. It was a we kid. <laughs> that's a baby. Sheep, right? <laughs> nah. <laughs> Matt. So Goodwood was, was nice awesome. guys. <laughs> well, exactly. Uh, Hollywood's like, I didn't even jump in on yeah, that. Hollywood's way, like, shut up. Hollywood, the, what blew me away was they had a couple of guys on bikes My there. My friends, yeah. Holy crap. With, with the train thing. And right? yeah. the triumphs. I don't know. And some of the stuff, like they were doing things I never... Yeah, it's no. fathom. They were like, standing on the seat, dry, like riding. Standing on the seat when the when the bike was like this, and they were standing on the on the back fender. Yep. So the mm-hmm. bike was straight up, straight yeah. up, and the guy was just leaned the you know was leaning the right, and the, the bike was just and and some of the I was blown away. That was probably yeah. one of the one of the top highlights. Yeah, most likely it was um, Nick Apex and Ernie. They they're sponsored by Monster, I believe. Oh yeah, and they do a lot of drift events. They they That's build. Crazy. They got two separate bikes, one for tricks and one strictly for drifting, and they got some awesome um, videos on YouTube as well. Well, like take a cop, look at the yeah. cop chases, but wow. it's all wow. state. No, no, it's all staged. Like oh, they have oh for drift. the icon, the icon. <laughs> the icon the <laughs> have you guys heard of icon? The um, you know, like motorcycle performance safety clothing wear. Icon the there's a a two seater plane. I know one of my it's former the, CFOs is CFO. Yeah, well, of course, Andrew would go I can't, No, I can't. It's like, you know, in my private space There's the show. Icon property down in Miami, which is another <laughs> But if you like cool there's, a, there's Carl Icon, who I think just recently, but he's got oh, a stadium Carl Icahn up. Just and, invested yeah. in Trump. <laughs> no, but if you, like, if you like those Bad guys, investment. like if you check out those videos, they're Great. awesome. It's all strictly... The cops drifting and them drifting. On yeah, the it's bike. a sick video. They, yeah, got like, they got like three videos out, and they're all sick. Yeah, we'll have check to show out, them at Check lunch. out Goodwood and see if anybody posted any videos from Goodwood. I, I was just looking. There are a bunch of stuff, but you know who's there? My nemesis from Bull Run, Robbie Gordon. Oh. Did you get to see him? Did you run into him? He yeah. the super truck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's on those. Super Wait, so what was the silliest there. thing you saw at Goodwood? In terms of silly. I mean, like, were, were you like, yo... Were you they wowed got by anything? Blah, blah, blah. Except, that, yeah. uh, I'll give it to him in there. The they, Red Wings. Like, really I mean, make you say, wow, this is an aha moment. That's an amazing car. They were Something awesome. I've never seen. The, what was great, there were so many things. They had the the jet fighters that were doing cra- right over the property. No, no, no. Car wise, what did you see? What was like bananas? So, this is just a massive see, celebration like a, of speed. It doesn't matter. Air, yeah. sea, the air. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't those, know that. No, sea. But, and then. We went to the ball at night, and they had this massive. It was like a cross between Cirque du Soleil and the acrobats and fire. It was this like Macy's firework. fireworks, like you should know, have Fourth of July blow. going and on over here. Near and dear to my heart, we're walking in, and I see this guy who's like six foot seven or eight, Gene Simmons from Kiss. Oh, wow! And cool. he did a set, one song, but they had something for everybody. It you should have invited cool. Seth. He's great with balls. It's too late for that joke. I was a little bit late. I was a little bit late. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, I didn't mean to. I was, you know, polite. Edit that out. Wait, it was yeah. poor. That was poor. Yeah, it was. Yeah, well, nothing's poor in your life. <laughs> <laughs> Listen. Wait. Yeah, I'm listening. Mr. Woodside, go ahead. I'm broke. Yeah, you're broke. I, I get know. to enjoy good things, and that's why I have no money. Yeah, sure, bro. No money. Yeah. yeah well, good wood did, Let's hear it. Wait. Goodwood was, it was a really an overload of senses, everything. It was just from the old stuff to the new stuff. Yeah. yeah. It was really fun to go Amazing. to Goodwood after we've been doing so much. We did Gumball. Yeah, you've been on a tear. Rush. You've been on a tear lately. You did Gumball, Gold Rush. We went straight to Lamont from there. Right. We came back. We did the Run 1000. Um, in Canada. Is, in Canada. <laughs> and then we went to Goodwood, which was... Meanwhile, your 918 has more miles on it than most people Priuses. True. Probably. Yeah. 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 Like, they just bought it, like, two months ago, and already it's got, like, 80,000 miles. Well, the first thing we did when we picked it up is drove in the rain to the ring, to the Nürburgring. Mm-hmm. Elizabeth put in a couple of nice... Oh, so you took a European delivery. Took yeah. Euro delivery uh, in Zuffenhausen. 
drove, like I said, right straight to the Nurburgring, stayed over in the Piston Clausen, which is this really it's the funky. You get, it's like you got to do it when you're there. <laughs> yeah, you have to stay at the Piston Clausen if you can. The only thing I missed in Germany was the Nurburgring, of all things. You have to go back. Yeah. We're going to do and that with the GT3 RS and GT4 at the end of the month. We're yeah, on July 31st, we will Seth can't go, he's broke. <laughs> Come, Seth. You know, FedEx, you can put, you know, air, punch air holes in the... The one I just sent you to my friend. Which one? The GT3 RS. Oh, GT3 RS, yeah. Hollywood has a friend that just bought one of those. It's not a bad flight to Germany. It was about seven hours, eight hours. Seven. One direction. Yeah, seven, yeah. It wasn't that bad. That's cool. We're on... I've been to Nürburgring. Air I stayed in that hotel. It's like in the middle. It's like a hotel right by the middle. I got stuck on that airline once. That's, yeah, you don't want to do that. You feel like you're in steerage. Pretty it's much. really bad. I didn't realize it. It was a new airline. I bought a ticket, hopped on it, and my knees were in my chest the entire flight. It was the smallest seat you've ever seen in your life. Air Berlin. You did a lot of that. Seth's good on his I knees. Used to do that. If if a normal seven forty seven holds, let's say three hundred passengers, they get four hundred on theirs. That's yeah. crazy. Got it's, to. It's wow. Extreme. <laughs> Fuck that. Anyway. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. It's a family show here. Anyway, so Goodwood was a great experience. I got to check that out someday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's you know, go to Goodwood. Lot of, a lot of these things I haven't been to. I mean, we'll I, go to the Bordy Barn and Goodwood. We we'll go to the yeah. Bordy Barn and we'll Goodwood. You know, just, yeah, there's so many things I haven't done. And Riverhead. Riverhead. Yeah, you, you yeah. could start by coming out of the closet. I could. Now that we have marriage equality, maybe I'll think about that. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. You all can tie the knot. You can be yeah. fianced. Now, be honest. Yes, I'd I rather be financed. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, now we, and, and now we can share medical insurance. Isn't that special? Fantastic. Which yeah. one has better? We have the same, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Obama. <laughs> but you know, this we're rolling into um, Pebble Beach, and there's Reno, which is uh, hot August nights up in Reno, mm -hmm. which is a lot of muscle car, Barrett Jackson kind of thing, and then that. And there's also. Um, Rensport reunion this year, right. which people don't know is just a Porsche only, yeah. company only event. They do it every two, three, four years, whatever they decide on. And Where's that at? It's going to be in Monterey and uh, Laguna Seca. Oh, cool. Which will be an awesome. It's the end of September. Okay. So that's something we're looking forward to. And we're going to do the Shelby Track Day and the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix. Which is and awesome then we'll be doing out. Import Fest in Toronto. What are you doing in October? <laughs> we have oh. a rally in October. You know what? Yeah, no, really? Which yeah, there's yeah. now. October, it's October 10th to the 13th. It's uh, uh, four days, three nights, which uh, starts in Manhattan, and we're going to be doing a uh, mid Atlantic loop back. So, uh, And that's sponsored by? Sponsored by <laughs> Exotics Rally and uh, Car Lifestyle and uh, The Art of Rap. And uh, that's whoever your else company, jumped right? on board. That is my company, yes. <laughs> uh, several companies. That, and we're, all my companies will be sponsoring my other company. So, uh, <laughs> he's got so much money, he sponsors himself. <laughs> Are there any particular cars that self insured? You... Um, yeah, I mean, last, last time, last time we had a, uh, a, a really nice array of cars. We had almost like one of everything. We had an LP640, we had a Gallardo, we had a Aston Martin DBS, we had a Porsche uh, GT3, and you know, just almost one of everything. I took my Spiker. Um, this year so far, we have about the same signups. We're looking to get more and expand it a little bit. It's a scavenger hunt. It's based on an app that a, uh, a friend of mine developed, and I, uh, I designed the whole app to, well, I designed the whole route to take you through the scavenger hunt to get to your destinations. Awesome. That's, so. that's an interesting twist, because we a lot of the rallies we've been on, whether it was Gumball or Gold Rush, or it's just really about who gets to the other end faster. Mm. Um, and the yes. scavenger. That's where like Seth wanted to stand apart from that. Right. Like, normal, I, normal I, rigmarole. As right. most people know, I, I did Gold Rush once. I did Bull Run four times. Um, and a lot of people know that that have gone on these rallies that they can become extremely dangerous at times. And the biggest problem I always have with the rallies are. Just because, and you'll, I'm sure you'll agree with this, just because you can write a check for a car doesn't mean you know how to drive. And you get these guys all the time that hop in a brand enough. Sure. You definitely can't. Well, Sorry, okay. well, inform you. Well, let's Maybe you should not go to Germany and pick up those two. Well, no, we definitely <laughs> shouldn't now. Just send me. Just send T minus. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I mean, so many people you read about it. You know, they have they picked up a La Ferrari, and you know, a week later, the thing's wrapped up at the side of a mountain. Um, and you know, too many times there's been too many problems on these rallies, and they get too dangerous where I took the 
the speed aspect out of it. So speeding does not help you whatsoever because it doesn't matter how fast you complete the tasks, you're gaining points by completing true rally. tasks. True yeah, rally. True rally, exactly. By completing tasks and uh, it's also, it's a social media interactive app that you take pictures, it populates on uh, Instagram and on Facebook and Twitter um, and you gain points by it and creativity counts and then I measure it at the end of each night and I award points to different people and first three places are cash prizes and then there's a spirit of the hunt award that's awesome that's yeah. cool you know what it's funny because on so can we count you guys in okay done what day, <laughs> uh, what, what, what day is it October October 10th through the 13th Columbus Day weekend Columbus Day weekend what kind of car would you well we'll see you Any know what why don't you just bring your McLaren F1 <laughs> Maybe. Andrew's like, why <laughs> did you bring that up? You know why he no, wants you to bring know. that car? I'm going to tell you why. So he can ride shotgun. He can't fit in there. <laughs> it's I a can three fit passenger. in there. No, you couldn't fit in there. It's a three passenger. You can't it's, fit. That's Actually, it's so tiny. I, I will tell like, you this. I like, sat in one, and it was you a You can't fit in the... In the um, it's small. In the side seat? No. It is small. No. Really? So I, I, is it like Lotus Elise small? It's made for like children. It really is. It's so small. It's so tight. It's smaller than Lotus Elise? You wouldn't be able to get in there. Oh, it's not happening. I won't get no, it. No, seriously. No, all kidding aside, there are just yep. some things that are, it's like it's like painting a fart. You can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where we're going with this podcast. We're at an hour and 40 minutes. Oh. Let's wrap this up. Well, let me wrap it up by saying thank you for, you know, taking the time. I think what you're doing on that rally is awesome. I think what I popped in my mind is we'd love to do that. Maybe yeah. with a couple of different cars. Um, I'm not sure if you're doing anything with car lifestyle and hashtagging the crap out of it on the way. Yes. One, one thing Elizabeth has done, and I'm sure you'd be happy to help out with the style guide and stuff, is doing your Snapchat stuff. Yeah. Which has been pretty we Right. Travel. Liz is actually I big on Snapchat. Big Snapchatter. Yeah. Yep. I have an amazing network and a, and a great list of contributors that go to events all over the world at all times. So what is better than seeing live action behind the scenes from someone just like yourself? This person will go to a NASCAR race while another person will be in Japan touring, right. you know, a garage while I'm on a rally, while someone else is at a car show. This is all happening at the same time around the world live, just small clippets like your best friend can't come to the show with you, so you want to tell them everything that's going on. So I do feel that Snapchat as well as Instagram is the future of how to bring content to the view. There's another, there's another app, I can't think of the name. Well, the, well there's Periscope and Meerkat, but those are constant video. live streaming. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think it's Periscope. That's yeah. the one that you could stream it's, and everyone- It's a live stream. Sending. Yeah, right. that, that's pretty it's, awesome right. too. Yeah, oh, definitely. I did it at the uh, Jacob Javits Center. Yeah, and you didn't have any followers at all. <laughs> <laughs> they were popping up all over the place. Hey. When I was out on my boat, just a bunch of followers. Oh, you're a dinghy? Cool. Yes, my I dinghy. I mean, currently, I mean, it's incredible to think all the viewers that I have just on my personal Snapchat, which is about 4.5 thousand per view, like mm. a snap, which is crazy because I'm just right. a single person trying to get you're a community engaged. together. You she would, is in more ways than one. Age. And you're not going to miss that one. <laughs> <laughs> Count on you. But it's true. I, I just here. love bringing. I just yeah, love way back. Who's going back in the time? <laughs> your fiance has your front. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously, that's a real knee slapper there, Seth. Okay, so again, thank you for coming out to all this way to join us on the podcast today. We appreciate having you. Um, I'm sure we could sit here and chat for hours at a time. Um, and we look forward to having you back someday to talk about, you know, maybe we'll talk about the Porsche project, which would be very cool to, to know the intricacies of how it's coming along and being built. And we can get some insider clues on the new Bentley SUV that Andrew is on the R&D team yeah, for. The, uh, hey, Bentley there is some Elizabeth White touches to that car, there are too. A few. There is a lady-driven aspect of that SUV. Is there? Mm -hmm. Maybe we can do something uh, together, either on the RWB with Car Lifestyle and the Art of Rap, and maybe even talk a little bit about that when we do something on a Snapchat with your rally. Cool. That could be very cool. Cool. I'm done. Absolutely. Yeah. So I guess we'll go around the room. Everybody will uh, give themselves a plug. T, the floor is yours. Oh, why don't we start with you, Seth? Okay, I'm Seth Rose. you'd love Rose. to talk about yourself. <laughs> I'm Seth Rose from Exotics Rally. You can find me at Exotics Rally. You can also find me at Art of Rap NY, that's A R T O F W R A P N Y. You can follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. 
I'm not a Snapchatter yet, but I'll have to look into that. You can also find me on Periscope and Meerkat. And uh, this is the Car Lifestyle Podcast. Again, if you guys have any questions, comments, or you want us to talk about a specific topic, you can email us at askclpodcast at gmail.com. And uh, we look forward to hearing from all of you. And we've been getting a lot of great feedback. Um, we'll be answering questions on some of the, uh, the in-between podcasts that we do, because every other week we have a guest, and then we do one ourselves. And on top of that, we just ask that you go on to iTunes and you rate the podcast. Of course, we look forward to good ratings. And T-minus? Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at, at T-minus underscore NYC underscore car lifestyle. And the business page at car lifestyle, one word. That's C-A-R-L-I-F-E-S-T-Y-L-E. Um, on Facebook... Um, if you're like some super hot girl, you can add me as a friend there. And if you're not, don't bother. And uh, <laughs> and that leads. Le- le- what, what, what is what's your grinder tag? <laughs> grinder. Oh, 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 oh. What the hell's a grinder tag? You know what grinder is? Come no, on. I really don't. No, it's some fucking homosexual shit. You guys are talking about. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck is grinder? That is. I, the, I know about fat, li- fat life. I have, I have a fat life page. <laughs> I do for my BDSM activities. That's correct. Okay, oh, but, but I've just <laughs> Google it. Yes, Hollywood, Google. Hollywood on Instagram at Hollywood underscore S T U N T Z, and also Cycle Lifestyle at Cycle Lifestyle. And Elizabeth, hey, it's Elizabeth, and you can follow us at It's White Noise on Instagram. Search It's White Noise on Facebook. Follow us on Snapchat at It's White Noise. And be on the lookout for itswhitenoise.com. Excellent. Andrew, do you want to add anything? Uh, nothing more than what's already been said. Excellent. Well, thank you again for, uh, for coming out this way and joining us on the podcast. Uh, again, this is podcast number 14. We appreciate all our listeners, and we look forward to many more in the future. We are out of here. Peace out. Our lifestyle. Thank you.